Okay, Ruben and I have a fascinating, sort of a scary story that's appropriate to this time of year, Halloween, although this is absolutely true from all the evidence and the credible eyewitnesses that were involved in it. So we're going to tell a scary story today, and it's all true. And um, I want to just say a little bit about how this book came about. Um, Reuben had the distinct uh, pleasure of knowing the investigator, the original investigator who compiled all the information about this case in the 1960s. And his name was Paul Cerny, who is now deceased. And he was an investigator for NICAP, uh, National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, which was a very active civilian UFO group in the 60s, I think back in the 50s as well, and is now no longer really active. Well, NICAP went through a transition where kind of a lot of the information from NICAP transferred over to the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, which is the leading, the world's leading UFO research civilian UFO research group. In the transfer of files, Ruben at the time was working, uh, he is currently the director of the, for MUFON in Northern California, but back at that time, uh, he got a chance to look at these files. The reason that the files about this case had not been made public really before is because the main witness, Mr. Donald Trump, who we're going to we're going to present his story today. He did not want his identity made known at the time that this incident happened in the 60s. Um, the reason was that he worked for one of the nation's leading missile defense contractors at the time, based in Sacramento, California, called the Aerojet Corporation, which Stan Friedman. I'm sure is well familiar with Aerojet. You did some consulting work for Aerojet, didn't you, Stan? Worked for him for three years. Yeah. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Shrum, the main witness in this case, worked at their Sacramento, California plant, which, by the way, later got into a lot of trouble with the federal government over toxic waste, the way they were disposing of a lot of the solvents, and materials that were used in, in building the rockets and the missiles for the U.S. military. So Mr. Shrum did not want his identity revealed. He was working for a subcontractor of the U.S. government, the leading maker of things like Polaris missiles and Titan missiles at the time. And that's the reason that this story did not come out really until recently, when Mr. Shrum, who is now around, yeah, he's approaching 80, and he contacted Ruben and me and said that he very much desired that, you know, as he gets near the end of his life, that he would like the entire story told uh, for once and for all. And so his wife, uh, Judy, who supported him through this whole art ordeal and their after effects, of the incident, which were very, very severe, as you know, you're about to hear. Uh, she recently, unfortunately, passed away, and we kind of dedicate the lectures that we do, the presentations that we make, and the radio programs that we do in her memory, because she wrote a heck of a good introduction, which I'm going to read just a small part of here in a minute uh, from our book. And in the meantime, Ruben, anything else? Uh, Tell, tell the folks a little bit about your, when you first met Mr. Shrum and how all of this came about. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much. Uh, folks, I actually just want to share with you, uh, both Noah and I have been working on this particular book project for more than a year and a half. <clears throat> but this is the very first time that both he and I have actually presented this case together. Uh, we normally do it on the radio. I live in California. And, uh, so we're several one thousand miles apart. So you're the very first audience. So we actually have had a chance to present it to you together. So uh, I'm really honored to be with uh, Noe because uh, 
without Noe's uh, assistance, uh, we would not have been able to get this into a book. But as Noe was saying, I, uh, at that time I was the assistant state director, and uh, I reported to a gentleman named Virgil Staff, who was our director for Northern California. And Mr. Paul Cerny was the previous state director for Northern California, and he had a title called Western Director, Regional Director. When Paul passed away, uh, Virgil had some of his files and he said, here we're going to want you to hold on to these files. And then, um, then he promoted me to become the state director and then Virgil became Western Director. So I'm going through the files and I came across this extraordinary case about this man who validly fought off being captured by, by these aliens in the remote forest up there in the the Tahoe National Woods, uh, which is uh, close to Rio, California. But it's his tale of his own personal war of the world, where he fought bravely uh, for a period of time throughout the night when he being captured. And this is going to be his story. Uh, we're very fortunate that uh, when I went to visit him, his son, helped us to capture his interview on video, so that way you're able to see it, and know you I put it into a very beautiful uh, format, so you'll get a chance to see it. There's a lot of detail that we're, we're going to try to cover as much, but most of the, the, the detail is in the book. So anyway, I'd like to now go ahead and uh, work with Noe, and we'll present the election. I'm going to read just an excerpt of this beautiful introduction to the book that was done by Mrs. Donald Shrum, who lived through this experience with her husband. And Mrs. Shrum, as we mentioned, just unfortunately passed away three months ago. April. And we were very, very sad to, to, to lose her. She was so excited, though, the day that the copies of this book arrived. We sent them the very first copies that were printed. And um, her son sent us back pictures of them opening the box of the books, taking out the books, holding them up for the camera. And it was, you could see the emotional impact of having their story finally told in full detail. And she wrote in the forward to the book, on a dark night in the Tahoe National Forest of Northern California in September 1964, my husband, Donald Shrum, encountered two unidentified flying objects and spent 12 desperate hours struggling for his life against aliens that seemed determined to abduct him. As I write these words, it has now been nearly 50 years since that fateful night when his bow hunting trip turned into a nightmare. That nightmare still reaches out to us from beyond time and space and continues to affect all of us to this very day. My husband's strange experience forever changed the course of our lives, and rarely does time go by without our remembering that horrendous night in 1964. Following the strangest of all experiences, Don and I sought out answers to our many questions about what happened to him. We turned to scientists, UFO investigators, doctors, the military, and others, but to no avail. Back in 1964, the kind of experience that my husband underwent was rare in the annals of human history. Few others on planet Earth had ever experienced such a frighteningly close encounter with alien visitors and lived to tell about it. Immediately after his UFO encounter, my husband suffered severe emotional trauma of the kind that has been observed in other alien abduction cases that have since come to life, such as that of Travis Walton in 1975. For about a year and a half after, my, after the incident, my husband suffered horrible dreams overwhelming anxiety and dreadful fears that the strange creatures he encountered in the forest would come back for him again. He was haunted by the sounds and sights that he experienced during his encounter, and the slightest trigger brought back a flood of anxiety. The after effects 
that he suffered, or the after effects of what he suffered, would be called post-traumatic stress syndrome uh, today. But that diagnosis was not available back in 1964. And I'm going to skip to the end because these were actually some of the last words that Mrs. Shrum uh, wrote before she passed, passed on. After all these years, and for the first time ever, we are disclosing in this book the entire story of my husband's amazing UFO encounter in hopes that others may learn from it and that others may finally know precisely what happened to us and that perhaps even so many years after the fact, somehow we might be able to gain additional insight into exactly what did happen in that dark forest. Reuben and I are hoping that wherever she is now, uh, she now has that insight. First, we're going to set the, geographically speaking, what, we're going to set the scene for this amazing story. And as you can see here, we're, we're looking at the California area. For example, here's LA. Uh, well, out of which Ruben flew yesterday, yeah. LAX, had a delay in, in flights there. And coming up past LA, you've got San Jose, which is the area where Ruben lives, San Jose and San Francisco, uh, right in there. And then up here you've got Sacramento. That's where Mr. Shrub worked at the, at the Aerojet Corporation plant. And then, um, he had a group or a cadre of friends who would go hunting with him in the nearby forest. And they went hunting most often with rifles. But this was not rifle season yet, and they wanted to go hunting. So they decided they had a long weekend, they had Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. And they decided to go bow and arrow hunting. And so he and two close friends of his, who also worked at Aerojet, were the ones involved in this story. And they went up here, um, right here in this area. Have I got that straight route? Right about there. There's the highway that goes between Sacramento and Reno. And right in here, you see kind of a shaded area? That's where the Tahoe National Forest is. So here is a close-up um, of the area. The, uh, the three gentlemen, Mr. Shrub and his two companions, uh, went there and uh, September 4th, oops, I didn't mean to do that, I'm sorry. September 4th, 1964, and they, uh, got, they decided to set up camp. The highway um, runs right up through here, so they just traveled, they parked up here and traveled by foot down and established a base camp. Uh, Mr. Shum told us right alongside the Loch Lennon or Loch Lennon Lakes. Um, anybody familiar with this area of California? Know anybody who's been out there? Uh, Ruben just went out there a few weeks ago to kind of look over where all this happened. And it pretty much still looks the same, very rocky, hilly, uh, forested area. Well, they established their base camp down here, and then the three hunters went down. Um, they stayed together for a while. They didn't have any kind of communication devices that they were using. They were just kind of signaling each other. They remained within view as they worked their way down these ridges. And then, somewhere around, around here, they each separated out and went their own ways. And Mr. Shrum ended up in this area, and that's where he had his UFO encounter. It's, there are no roads to go out to where this happened. Um, the closest you can get is up here, um, one of these small roads, um, which is you know several miles of, of really rugged hiking to get down there. And we're going to talk about what happened. There's a picture of Mr. Shrum, who was 26 years old at the time. And 
as I mentioned, employed by the Aerojet Corporation. This is a map that he drew. Here's Highway, what was known as Highway 40 at that time, in 1964. Here's uh, Sacramento this way, Reno this way. Here's a small town, and it's still small, right? It's a tiny little village, uh, Cisco Grove. And, and then uh, Mr. Sherman indicated that it was three, uh, three miles to where they established their base camp, right alongside the Lock Lake Lakes. And then, of course, you know, I mentioned that they came down this way. And finally, Mr. Sherman ended up in this area. And that's, that's where he had this really strange encounter. We're going to pick up the story from Mr. Shrum himself, so he can explain that they were out hunting, they became separated from each other, he essentially became lost, they hadn't actually been to this area before, and so he became separated from his companions and got lost, and it was getting dark, there's a lot of bridges and places where you could really hurt yourself, plus the fact that you could encounter wild beasts there. So they had agreed that if they became separated like this on previous hunting expeditions, they had agreed that they would each find a place to, a safe place to rest for the night. Uh, rock, a large, you know, a cave or a group of boulders where they could be protected from predators, that would be good. Um, and he explains here how he came to the decision of the tree that he decided to use as a shelter for the night. Well, we were getting ready for the evening hunt, and uh, I, I was a, went down the one bridge, and this one friend of mine went down the canyon, bar, and the other went down the other, other bridge. And, uh, when we got to the end of the bridge, it was just a sheer drop off where I was, so I had to backtrack and go down and around uh, the, the other side of the bridge. And by the time I got to the bottom, it was dark, pitch black. And uh, so I, I stumbled through the brush, I couldn't see nothing, it was just dark. It, you know, before the moon comes up, it, it's, it's just really dark. And uh, I, I, like I said, I crashed through the brush and stuff, and uh, I could see the moon was starting up, and I saw uh, a very big grand cliff with a, uh, a crack moving up the side, and the crack was about a foot wide, so I was able to walk up there. And there was a tree right at the edge when I got up there. So I figured there's a lot of bear in that area. So I figured I'd spend the night in the tree. The, the base of the tree to the first limb was uh, about 12 feet. But from the rock, uh, it was only about 7 feet. I could reach up and hand walk out to the trunk of the tree. And then uh, pull myself up and uh, anyway, it, it was a, it was two two limbs come out on an angle, and then there's one that I sit on, and then I put my foot on the other, and. Uh, So uh, I, I was figuring I'm spending the night up there. How, how, for, how far away was the tree from the campsite approximately? Uh, it was probably close to a mile, maybe three quarters. So your campsite wasn't really that far away from you? No. Decided to stay in that tree and 
thereby avoid, you know, becoming prey to the bears, the numerous bear sightings that have been in that area and other predators. So um, his decision then was to stay in this tree and try to rest as best as he could. He had a a belt, an army type, military type belt that he was planning to use to secure himself up on one of the branches. So it was at that time that he noticed a strange object off in the distance, kind of a glowing orb of light. He said when he first saw it, it looked like someone was walking on top of one of the ridges carrying a lantern ahead of him except that it would bob up and down and move up and down. And it was off in the distance and it was coming, it seemed to be coming toward him. Uh, he saw it coming in this fashion. Once again, his position is right about here. And he, as we're going to hear him in a minute say, first it was kind of meandering in this direction. And then he had the thought that because the three hunters had become separated from each other, that perhaps his two friends had contacted the Forest Service and they had sent a helicopter out to find him. So he got excited about that and he built three small fires, one on top of, uh, kind of on top of three small boulders here. It's kind of a signal fire so that these guys that were moseying along like this would see the signal and sure enough, this object, which turned out not to be a helicopter, but apparently it was attracted by the signal he, he made, because after lighting those fires, it made this turn and started coming in his direction. It was a very large, dark object. He estimated later that it was 120 feet from boat, uh, from bow to stern, about 120 feet. But the first thing he saw about it that caught his attention is a very bright light at the front of it, which he called the headlight. Um, at first, he was, you know, he couldn't see the rest of it because the body was dark. These three panels did not open up until later. They were lighted panels that suddenly opened up on the side of the craft. But at first, the whole hull of it was totally dark. So all he could see was a small pinpoint of light at the front of the leading edge, as we're going to hear in this next clip from Mr. Donald Sean. And I saw a light. It looked like a man going up and down the trail. But then it came over the over the, over the top of the tree, and I got kind of excited me because I thought it was a uh, helicopter from the Forest Service. And uh, I, I, I stood up between two of the fires that I built on the, on the rocks and waved my arms and yelled and screamed and, and uh, finally uh, that light started coming towards me. So I was really relieved then because I thought it was a helicopter still. Until I got within, oh, maybe 60 feet or yards, I'm not sure the distance at night. Uh, but it just stood hovered there with no sound. So then I panicked because I knew it was no helicopter. I thought it was something from outer space. But it looked like all I could see is a little, about an 80 inch glow. So I thought it was just a little tiny. It's, <laughs> you know, it's flying saucer. And then I, uh, I kind of panicked and I walked through my ball up in the tree again and hand walked out that, that limb and got up in the tree. And I had all the camouflage clothes on, so I figured, well, they won't see me here. But then this, this light went a half circle around me over the canyon. Then I could see the whole, the shadow of the whole uh, spacecraft. And it was, that was just a, a light that was on the nose of it. In this, 
In describing this incident, uh, the subject, Mr. Sean, later underwent regressive hypnotherapy, and it was then that it became clear in his mind what an immensely large object this was. He described it as a mothership. It was, uh, he approxim uh, approximated the uh, diameter of it at 120 feet. So in other words, like a 10-story tall building turned on its side, hovering just a short distance away from him. Um, this object, Mr. Shrum, who, as, I, as I've already been, we've mentioned, worked in missile defense, was familiar with the missiles, the aircraft, the, uh, the, the company he worked for also worked on the boosters for the early uh, space missions. And so he was familiar with what human technology had in the way of rocketry and, and uh, aviation. And he knew that this object, whatever it was, was certainly not made on Earth. Now, what happens next is extremely interesting and very unusual. Ruben and I have studied many other UFO cases looking for, you know, to compare and contrast what Mr. Sharp underwent with other similar cases perhaps in the past. And we couldn't find any. I mean, this case has a lot of unique characteristics to it. Uh, what happened next, for example, is really, really unique. You have this massive object, about 120 to 150 feet wide. And um, when he first noticed it, it seemed to be tipped at a, at a slight angle. And it had this small white light seen at the first by Mr. Schrum. And this hole, this hole was completely dark. These three vertical slats were not there when Mr. Shrum first saw the object approaching. But then all these three panels slowly slid open. And they were, there seemed to be illumination coming out of there. So he was under the tree dressed in camouflage clothing. And he had uh, his, his only, oops, his only weapons were the, he had a bow and three arrows. And he was looking at this immense object that went off, you know, toward the horizon that was so vast. And it was just hovering over this canyon, um, you know, at, at about eye level. I think we can imagine ourselves being in that predicament and we probably would have required a change of clothing. Yeah. <laughs> camouflage clothing. The camouflage clothing would have had more camouflage spots on it. Okay. okay. So, um, just to recap, uh, the initial sighting, then he set the signal fires and then started coming down his way and it hung over this ridge or this canyon, and it was just it was just right here. Here are the three vertical slats and the small light at the end of it. And uh, here's another based again on Mr. Shrum's description. It's another drawing, artist's conception of the three vertical slats and this huge cylindrical dark object with a blinking light at the front. And then something really strange happened. Out of the center panel came a smaller ship, and it started moving toward him. And then I saw three panels of light, like windows or whatever. And uh, they, uh, I saw a flash coming from the bottom of the center one. And you saw a dark object go down to in the canyon and I lost track of it. And uh, then the next thing I saw was saw the blink of light up on the top of the ridge was where the, the first one came from. This object that you first saw that left the, the uh, center of the panel. What did it look like on Well, at that time, all I saw was a flash and saw a dark object go down. Dark object kind of a shape. Well, I couldn't really say it went so fast. But then I, I saw when it landed up on the, up on the ridge, 
that it, uh, I can see uh, like a, a hat, I can only see part of the top, but it had a little light on it, and uh, looked like the top of a flying saucer that I've seen in the pictures. So I kept, kept my eyes on that. Okay, going back to the map that was drawn by the eyewitness, um, the ship, the huge uh, mothership, what he describes as a mothership, was hanging just a short distance away from him, right over the bridge of the canyon, right, right up above the and then out of the center of the panel, a vertical slab, came the smaller ship, and it cruised along past him and went some distance away and then seemed to land or stop its movement. So that's where we are in the narrative. And then an amazing thing happened. He saw the first of several entities that, he, that came into close contact with him and seemed to be attempting to abduct him. Um, he called the first entities that he saw coming out of his small ship, he called them the humanoids. So we're going to listen to his description now. And, uh, and I heard some trash and brush, probably five, ten minutes, these two humanoids come out of the brush kind of broke some of the brush off and, and uh, was looking at it. And then they came straight underneath the tree and looked up at me. And I, I knew right then I was thinking. <laughs> they found me. Yeah, they found me. Can you describe it for us? Yeah, it looked like uh, four or five feet. Of course, I'm looking down at them, so they would be shorter than they probably are. And uh, they had a silvery, like a one-piece uh, suit on, and it seemed like it had the, the, the joints, puffy joints, you know, on the shoulders and, and elbows, and, and the legs I didn't see that clear. The human legs uh, with their were you able to see their faces? No, uh, it was just a kind of a dark shadow. I could see the, the two uh, like eyes that were, I like, looked like welding goggles to me. It was the same as welding goggles. And then the rest of the face was kind of a blur. I could see looking down at them. It reminded me just, like I said, like a welding couple. Well, that wasn't the last of the surprises for Mr. Shrub that evening because another distinctively different type of creature appeared on the scene moments later, which Mr. Shrub thinks the impression that he got was that it might have been mechanical, a mechanical being. It seemed to move more stiffly. But in appearance, it was not, at, not really that much different from the original humanoid figures. In fact, Mr. Schrum, at one point in the interviews that we've done with him, he said, well, you know, it could have been the same meaning, but in a bulkier suit, in perhaps a suit that was adapted to some other use. So perhaps, it was the same type of being, but just in a different suit. Uh, but however, as, as I mentioned, he, his general impression was that this was some kind of mechanical being. And so we refer to it in our book as a robot creature, or robot appearing creature. And we're going to hear Mr. Shrub's own description of that. And then, uh, then I saw uh, two flashing red, orange light eyes coming, just picking its way down the ridge, just between the rocks and, and around them and everything, and it kept down and it was on the, 
this big boulder, this big flat rock. Uh, and then uh, he kind of looked up at me and he uh, moved his hand in, in this to the fire centers and it's kind of scary. And the, uh, the eyes of this other uh, creature like the uh, robot, what, what did that look like to you? It had uh, kind of like fire. It's kind of an orange, reddish orange, kind of yellowish orange. Uh, and they, it kind of flickered like fire. And they're about the same diameter, it's about two inches in diameter as the humanoids. I, I should mention that this, this figure up here was actually drawn by Mr. Shrum right after the encounter. And it was, he, he gave his full testimony in 1960, just a few months after the incident, which occurred in 1964. He gave, full testimony about it, but he asked that his name be withheld. So when Mr. Trump contacted us and told us the story over again, and not that we didn't trust him or anything, but we took the testimony that he gave in 1965, and we, Ruben and I, transcribed it word for word because it was in, in an audio cassette recording. And then we took the text of it and the text of what he said just a couple of years ago when Ruben first interviewed him. We compared side by side and in 50 years his story had not changed, not an iota. I mean that's how vividly, the gentleman is around 80 years old, and that's how vividly it, it all stuck in his mind. You know, I just want to say, uh, just follow his body language see how he's recollecting, but it, when he was sharing that information, it was, it was happening right there. And of course, uh, he's still very much was traumatized by it as, as we get more into it. Later on, when he talks about getting to the point where he was thinking of ending his own life, because this was such an intense experience, uh, you, you're going to see the emotion well up in you. Um, so what happened next is the introduction of these new creatures, the robotic appearing creatures. Uh, they came up to, one of them came up to the base of the tree and it issued forth out of its, what we would call the mouth, from the lower part of its face or jaw, this billowing cloud of smoke that slowly rose up into the tree where Mr. Shrum had taken refuge. And um, we believe that the gas or vapor that was used on this occasion was some type of asphyxiant. Uh, what it did was it caused Mr. Shrum to temporarily black out for short periods of time. He would come to fairly quickly but it was apparently an attempt by these creatures to render him unconscious long enough for him to be taken, abducted. And uh, so this went on um, for quite some time that these creatures would issue this gas and he would snap out of it after falling unconscious for, for a short while. And he's going to describe in his own words what happened.
and it fell over my bow. That's the only thing that kept me in the tree. And then, uh, so I figured they were out to get me then. Ruben mentioned that Mr. Trump faced his own personal war of the worlds. And it certainly appears that way, and it was certainly his impression that these beings were definitely out to get him. So, Mr. Shrum had in his possession at the time of his incident virtually no form of defense other than the bow and three arrows that he had been using for his hunt. Uh, and, and this is interesting because Ruben and I have appeared on many radio shows. We've done the George Norrie Coast to Coast about this incident. We've done many other shows. And over the course of time, you know, you talk things through, you discuss it with other people. And one of the things that we've come up with is, you know, there have been many uh, close encounters with UFOs and the beings from these craft where modern technology, modern weapons, fail to operate during a UFO encounter. In other words, the rifles won't fire. The, um, you know, the technology will not work. It becomes, I mean, they exercise apparently some sort of power, some sort of energy field. But Mr. Schrum did not have any of these more technologically sophisticated weapons. He had one of mankind's most primitive weapons weapons, which is the bow and arrow. And so, apparently, that's what made this type of weapon effective in this case, in that he was able to use it and hold them off for a bit longer, as we will hear in this next video clip. So, I, I had a 60-pound bow, which is a very high velocity. And I got shot. Since he was out of the robot, the only thing that was causing me harm, I shot the chest area, and it had to be the right at that at that distance, because I'm only about seven eight feet from him. And it, when I hit the chest, the spark would fly like electrical. Like an art world, kind of. And then that, uh, that robot backed up and almost knocked him down. He kind of fell back against the rock. And the two at the, at the bottom took off and headed for the brush and stood out there about 30 feet from me. And, uh, then uh, I shot uh, two more arrows, and it was about the same time sequence that uh, these uh, two humanoids would, every time I would shoot, they'd go back up into the, the brush, just, out, just almost out of sight. Uh, it's a remarkable story, and uh, we're getting to the really exciting part now. This is a picture that Mr. Schrum gave to Ruben uh, just a few years ago. This is the actual bow that he was using. It's a recurve wooden, uh, wooden composite, uh, wood, wooden bow. And uh, this is one of the arrows, not, not one of the actual arrows, but a similar arrow to what he used in the incident. So he ran, he had expended the only ammunition he had, which was the three arrows, and he was running out of options as he saw it. Uh, one of the things he did think of, being an avid outdoorsman and hunter, he was looking, he was thinking of ways to survive this ordeal. And one of the ways he came up with was he had plenty of matches. He always carried many, many matches with him on his hunting excursions. So the immediate thought that came to him was he could light, uh, light up pieces of his clothing, 
of branches from the tree and throw them down because he had noticed that these creatures seemed to be particularly interested and kind of perhaps a little tentative when they were looking at the fire at the burning embers of the three signal fires he had, he had uh, lit earlier in the evening. So he noticed that they seemed kind of scared or tentative around the, the glow, still glowing embers at the base of the tree. So he thought that perhaps fire might be a deterrent to them that might buy them some more time to hopefully survive this abduction attempt. So this is what he said happened next. Then I, I ran out of uh, arrows. So I only had three left. And uh, I started, I thought, well, I had, that's when Tommy carried me. It's just, I mean, the, the cap I had on me just soaked a little oil. Yeah, from my hair, yeah, 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 from me. And uh, they, uh, I always carried uh, all kinds of books of matches with me when I hunted. And so I lit that cap and it just blazed up and I dropped it down the base of the tree. And just in that, Instant, they, they moved back about 12, 15 feet, and that uh, I, I glanced over at the, the ship that was uh, over the canyon, kind of almost level with me, and it was almost out of sight, just like a star. It moved that fast, just in that second. So then I got the idea that they're scared of fire. So I, I burned everything but my t-shirt and my jeans. And uh, come to find out later on that it was 32 degrees out and I was shaking and kind of overexposed to the weather. And I, at one time I threw, uh, I had a bunch of change. I threw it down and they, they all kind of gathered around it. Well, after I uh, shut my, or, or started burning stuff and throwing it down, and I even uh, uh, tied some of my shirt that I ripped up uh, to a compass so I could try to get some brush because there was nothing right underneath the tree. And uh, I caught a little pile of brush on fire. I figured that would bring in Calvary. <laughs> that uh, when I run out of stuff to burn, I head for the top of the tree. And then, uh, then I, I'd, uh, I, it was a pretty sparse tree I could see down to the ground. And I broke off the top and threw it down. And anytime I throw it down or, or shake the tree, these humanoids are back up. Ruben and I have heard this story many times and it's still captivating, totally captivating, to re-experience what he went, went through. So now, one of the questions that Ruben asked him during this video interview, which I thought, of course, was a great interviewer, but this was especially a key fact. There was an exchange of sounds, apparently, among these creatures, and between the creatures and the ships. Um, it could have easily been mistaken as bird song or owls, but there was definitely noise, and Mr. Trump says he got the impression that this was communication among the beings, as we're gonna hear in, in his next description. Did you hear any noise between them in the patient? Was there any? You know, uh, I heard a uh, kind of a, a cooing or uh, <coughs> almost like an owl, but it could have been an owl, you know, the, 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 up there. But it just kind of fit in with, with them. So, so when they heard this owl-like sound, what would 
light that the sun had come up yet. And uh, I was just hanging by my belt, my head down, my feet down, and they were gone. So I knew I made it. <laughs> I went through the night. Just go back. Did you did you fall asleep or were you were this gas? Oh, did it overwhelm you? Uh, yeah, that's when it is. It, it completely engulfed the whole tree and, and got up to me and, and I don't know how long I was I was out, but it was just uh, it was you could see this uh, dim glow of the sun in the on the clouds and stuff, not clouds, but in the sky. And then uh, when I woke up it was light. But the sun hadn't come up yet. We're going to pause here just for a moment and, and tell you that for years, Mr. Shrum was very, very concerned that during his final blackout period, his final period in which he was overcome by the massive volume of gas and he passed out for much longer than before, he was concerned that they had actually reached him after that and had, you know, done something to him, taken, taken him somewhere. So it wasn't until later when he underwent hypnotic regression that it became clear that they had never reached him. In fact, he was able to finally, in the end, win out and they, they did not get to him. Uh, he said that when he awoke, he was kind of hanging by his military-style belt in the tree. And, uh, by the way, I mentioned that two other hunters had gone in the woods. One of them saw the initial appearance of the mothership and gave a written affidavit that he saw the ship. And that was Mr. Vincent Alvarez that you see up here in this picture with his wife. And um, here's Mr. Shrum with the other member of the hunting party, Mr. Tim Trueblood, who's pictured here on the left. This is Mr. Shrum at age 26, shortly after the incident. Here's Mr. Alvarez who actually saw the appearance of the first ship. Well, a very interesting thing happened, and Ruben and I have just received communication from his eldest daughter, Mr. Shrum's eldest daughter. She hadn't really spoken to us previous to just a few days ago. Uh, she sent us an email in which she says she remembers that after this incident, there were, many, there were several visits to their home by these strange men dressed in dark suits. And they, when, whenever they had a verbal confrontation with, with their dad, you know, he would become very upset by it, and it had to do with the fact that he wasn't supposed to tell anybody what had happened. So I'm going to share with you now what he said about how the Air Force treated him. Then what happened afterwards? Um, uh, well, my family, I told them, and then uh, the only outside person at that time was a, a professor at uh, one of the colleges, and my mother-in-law had gone, it was her professor when she was younger, so we told him the story, and he's the one that contacted uh, the Air Force. Well, they made an appointment with two, two uh, posted representatives of the Air Force, and they tried uh, disillusion me. They said, "Well, you know, the Japanese might have had somebody out there. You know, they were still, <laughs> you know." And they said, "The Boy Scouts uh, dressed up, you know, and talking just to scare somebody." And I said, yeah, I'm sure they're going to spend all night to keep the guy in a tree, you know. And, uh, oh, then they said, well, the Army probably been bid whacked up there and was in a training camp. So my father was in the Air Force. So he called and found out there was no military in that area for any reason, because it was, it was a pretty desolate area. And then they tried to disillusion me in every way they could. And they, they took the arrowhead 
And when he went back, uh, the area had been raised. And it is an area probably 50 feet around that tree. And there was cigarette packages and cigar butts. And so I know the Air Force checked it out pretty good. And they had an easy way to find it because it was there's an orange circle around that tree that where it caught the fires. And it, it was still an orange, so they, they had no problem finding it. And I, I, I marked on the map that they had where it was, the location. So the Air Force representatives who came who initially came to see him. It turned out later a Freedom of Information Act was filed by Mr. Cerny, and it turned out that they had been dispatched not from the, either of the two local military bases near in Sacramento, they had been sent from Wright Patterson Air Force Base near Dayton, Ohio. So they had come all the way from Ohio to interview him to tell him that what he had actually experienced was a group of Boy Scouts dressed in Halloween outfits that were out just trying, in the middle of nowhere, miles from civilization. And they were out there keeping this poor guy in the tree. And by the way, surviving when he shot arrows directly into their chests to have the arrows harmlessly bounce off. So these were Boy Scouts dressed in Halloween costumes. So some guys from the Air Force uh, we're trying to dissuade him and discourage him, discouraging him from believing that he actually underwent something extraordinary. So, as you can imagine, this had a tremendous impact, not only on his life, but on his entire family's uh, rest of their lives, even to this day. We're going to hear in this video uh, some of what he experienced right afterward. This is one where you can really feel the emotion, his emotion. I'd like to go there, but I just wanted to ask you, how long has this affected you? Did you have any like, years or anything like that? Well, for a year, I had I mean, screaming nightmares. I mean, I'd wake up. Uh, you know, those eyes, those eyes, and um, I'd be just a cold sweat, I'd be drenched in sweat, and uh, I even, I even um, thought about when I was up on top of that tree. I uh, thought about just jumping off and jumping down the canyon and just killing myself. But the only thing that kept me going is I had a little girl, my wife, and they kept me fighting. So, it's a, it's a remarkable story and one that not many people have heard uh, because as I mentioned at the beginning, he withheld most of the story and the, the identities of those involved until just recently when he contacted us and asked, you know, if we would be interested in writing a book. And unfortunately, shortly after the book was published, uh, we lost Mrs. Shrum, uh, who died in April of this year. And Ruben, I'm going to have you come forward with some closing thoughts and then any questions the audience members have, have about this remarkable story. Thank you, Joey. And, um, as you mentioned, um, uh, Judy definitely it was her wish to, uh, to help support her husband through this ordeal of us uh, publishing this book. And, like, the book itself uh, was what I call synchronicity because it took a while, and then uh, as all, all everything came together, so we were able to uh, get the book out and, and uh, we fulfilled her wish. And, uh, we hopefully we uh, enlighten you as to one of the most interesting cases that we have found. There's a lot of interesting cases of abductions out there, and this is one of them that, that, uh, that we find also 
inviting me. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'd, we'd like to you know if you have any questions you'd like to share with us, or you know, if anyone. Um, and if not, we're going to be over at our table, and you know, we encourage you to, uh, if you're interested in our book, uh, there's a lot more detail that we weren't able to share with you uh, in this presentation, but it's all covered in our book. And uh, well, we thank you very much for taking the time to come here. So I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Newton. Thank you very much, folks. And um, we've got uh, Roger with more announcements. Okay, thank you. Excellent job. I even did the call. They have the book over there and you're certainly welcome to buy it. We'll talk to you more about it, autograph, those type of things. Now, be sure we're going to join Roy and Ruby tomorrow for this fascinating lecture. They're going to be speaking at about 3 o'clock tomorrow on the UFO that reportedly crashed 40 miles uh, from here on August 25th. We won't want to miss that lecture. Mexico to Roswell. So that'll be tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Coming up next is the featured attraction, of course, and you might say one presentation you absolutely must not miss. It will change the way that you look at life in the universe. Nuclear physicist Stanton Freeman, world's leading authority on UFOs, will present a remarkable lecture titled Man's Place in the Universe. Exactly how many millions of Earth type planets can be out there? It's hard to say, since the number keeps going up almost daily. Must, if, you, if you must miss the lecture, you don't want to miss this next one, which begins at 6 30 p.m. All right. We'll see you then. We're going to move it up to 6. Uh, you want to move it up to 6? Yeah. Okay, let's move it up to 6. Uh, who do you run? Is that correct? Who do you run? Okay, 6 o'clock, we'll start the lecture of standard.